um, to reclaim open. Um, and I am really glad that you guys are all here for this afternoon, um, physically sitting in a room together and understanding what the meaning and purpose is of that or the value of it, because um, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but thank you also to those of you who are watching virtually um, and having your own experience in your own rooms. Um, so uh, I'm Anya Kamenetz, and um, I'm here with Josie Frazier um, of Digital Le Leicester. Lich Lich Lester. Lester. Yeah. Lester. Um, and Freeman Murray from Jaga. And um, they are the two winners of the, um, of the innovation contest whose efforts are very located in specific places. Um, and so what I thought we would talk about today is sort of um, we think of openness very often virtually and there's always the value, but there's a constantly constant debate about the value of being in person um, when we do so many things online. So um, I want to just invite each of you first to kind of briefly explain, you know, your project and what you do and then we'll kind of talk about, you know, what it means to be in a place when you're doing open learning. So you want to start? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to say a big hello to everybody in the UK who's tuning in today. Um, it's 10 o'clock on a Friday night in the UK, mm. so people are obviously partying while they're watching this there. Cheers. And I'll um, say a special hi to Richard Hall, who is our uh, academic partner at De Montfort University, and also to Lucy Atkins, who works with me at Leicester City Council as our Digital Literacies Research Associate. Um, they're the other core members of our team who weren't unfortunately be able to come in person today, but I know will be watching and correcting what I say in the stream. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm here representing the Digilit Leicester project. I'm really, really happy to be here and really honoured as well to be um, in such excellent company with the other projects here today because um, I'm a big fan of all of the other projects too. So the Digilit Leicester project um, is a two-year project, but it, is, it has been designed to continue after the two-year period, and we're a year into it now. The idea behind it was that in Leicester, I work with 23 schools uh, of varying kinds. So they include mainstream schools, they include uh, schools for children with a variety of special education needs, and they also include schools for pupils who've been excluded from mainstream settings for a variety of reasons. Um, a very, very diverse student body in a very, very diverse city. Leicester is a fantastic place. I invite you all personally to come and visit because it's a great city in Leicester, um, but a very, uh, very diverse city. Um, so what the project is trying to do is it takes place within uh, a large build programme and I head up the ICT strand of that build programme. And we're rebuilding and refurbishing 20, 23 schools across the city. Um, and what we're wanting to do is really take advantage of this opportunity to support staff in transforming their learning and look at their teaching and learning practice right across the city. So the aim is to support every learner in the city. Um, and the way, that, what, the way that I'm supporting that by happening is through this project, which is a framework that's been developed in partnership with our schools um, that looks at various areas around digital literacy and asks the question, well, what does digital literacy look like when it's situated in secondary school practice? And for uh, people not familiar with the UK system, secondary school means learners from the ages of 11 years old to either 16 or 18. So the project that we're doing is supporting identifying what digital literacy looks like in practice so that we can develop together a common vocabulary, a common understanding of different approaches to using technology to support learners and learning. And then identifying as a city where our strengths and weaknesses actually are. And we've carried out a big survey of the cohort of staff I work with, which are 1,900 staff approximately. Um, from that, we've been analysing data over the summer 
and we've been giving people individual feedback on where they are. Um, we've been talking to school leaders about what their schools look like and we've been talking to people about what the picture across the city looks like. We have another year to run and in that year we're going to be focusing on working with the schools on a variety of projects to support moving the schools along, moving individual practitioners um, forward in their practice wherever it is that they may be, whether they're right at the beginning of that process or whether they're very, very confident. Great, great, excellent. Um, I'm Freeman Murray with, with Jaga. Jaga is a sort of technology and arts community center based in Bangalore, India. We've been running for about four years now. Really started as this sort of coming together of the arts and technology communities where we set up a, a large physical space in Bangalore. We have maybe 4,000 square feet where we've, we, it's kind of a hacker space. We have co-working, we have a lot of events, meetups, hackathons, workshops, exhibitions that have been happening in our space. Last year, we, we ran a couple of study groups alongside the, the first MOOCs that came out, the machine learning and artificial intelligence class. And, and so we got a little bit of experience sort of running that and then, and then also seeing sort of what happened where we had a lot of people sign up for the class. We had a bunch of people come to the first meeting, about half come to the second meeting, and, and we just had this sort of heavy attrition and then we did another program called the Startup School, which was sort of a, a combination of, of uh, incubation and also uh, helping some people learn technology skills, which was great, but I felt that the, the experience of the people coming into it was a little bit too diverse, and I wanted to be able to focus people's attention a little bit more, have everybody not on exactly the same track, but at, at a similar level so that we could uh, provide similar resources. And so our next project, which is what we won the award for, is the Jaga Study Program. And with the Jaga Study Program, we're really trying to take our, our physical space, which is you know, this four or 5,000 square feet in central Bangalore, and turn it into a kind of a, a physical campus to provide kind of a university experience that really leverages the, the online coursework, uh, specifically in computer science, so that we can take a, a batch of, of young people who really want to learn to become professional software developers, uh, mobile and web um, application developers, and walk them through sort of a, a series of online courses plus uh, additional uh, physical workshops and other activities to really sort of get them to the point of being uh, competent software developers that are industry ready and can work with startups or companies in India or internationally. And so we, we really want to sort of look at what the, what the assistance, what are the other things that we can provide to our students on top of the, the education materials that are freely available on the internet to help them be more successful. And so the things that we're, we're lining up are coaches who will sort of aren't technical experts, but are, are just there to sort of help you stay on track and, and keep going. So sort of like your mom. They, they know that, that you have a homework due tonight. They know that there's a test on Friday. They know there's a project next week. They just sort of check in with you to see how this is going and, and identify problems before, before you just drop out of the class. We're also trying to line up experts. Basically, we feel that we can't afford to hire full-time professional software developers to sit with us, but that we can get people to sign up three to five hours a week and, and then to support us primarily through email and then with an office hour every week. And then other sort of advisors um, that help sort of chart your academic plan. So this is sort of the combination of things that we're looking at, at sort of providing um, to, to help people sort of really stay on track, go through a one-year full-time program, and hopefully come out the, the far end of this as, as industry-ready, capable of making web and mobile applications. Great. It's really cool. So it sounds, it's really interesting the juxtaposition between these two because it seems like, um, you know, you're really focused, it's kind of a classic model, you're like importing some content from somewhere and then creating stuff around it. And you're, it seems like you're doing something a little bit different because you're pulling in 
you're helping ad the community themselves identify what it is that they want to know, right, and, and sort of take the learning from there. Um, but the question I want to put to both of you guys is, you know, this world of, of online enabled learning ha was called distance learning for a long time. And the, what's implied in distance learning is sort of that whatever's happening is far from the center, that it's being distributed outward from one place to another, um, or at least that it's connecting to places that are very far. And you know, wh how do you enable an open learning project that's in a location to feel like it is homegrown and native grown and it's about developing capacities and not about what you're lacking and what you're going to get from somewhere else, if you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, a, a community development is a massively important strand that runs through our program mm -hmm. and the use of technology to make activity in those communities visible so that um, the communities are better able to integrate and communicate to their wider audience. So they're, lo they're the people that live locally, um, parents and carers, mm -hmm. uh, school governors, um, which varies in terms of how well schools manage that, but obviously can be massively enhanced by technology. Mm -hmm. I think when I started out as an ed tech, as a education technologist, which is a long time ago now, um, my experience online was very much at a distance, as you describe it. So the people that I uh, met as friends, so Alan is one of the people who's mm. here today, Alan Levine, um, in those days, they were all over the world. They were in Australia, they were in Canada, they were in America, um, and our community was very much a distributed one. Um, and it was about people who didn't, who were trying to surface things in local communities, but um, actually had very, very strong ties online at distance rather than locally. I think um, with the mainstreaming of technology, that's very, very much changed now. Mm. And um, you know, whether it's people communicating passive-aggressive messages through their Wi-Fi network names or um, community reporting. Um, we have a great project in Esther called Citizens Eye that focuses on working with different kinds of community to develop citizen journalist skills. Um, the the um, mainstreaming and the increased access of technology in, in different ways mainly through the rise of social media, mm -hmm. I think has changed that picture very, very much so. I think if you look at something like um, what children, are actually, children and young people are actually getting up to online, they are not necessarily living out the dream of the early internet communities. They're not necessarily making friends all over the world, talking about things, discovering exciting new communities, although they are doing that. But what they're very, very much doing is they're reinforcing their friendship networks and their close ties. They're connecting to their parents, they're connecting to their school friends, they're continuing those relationships. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think actually it's, it's very timely to take advantage and, and build on that. Mm -hmm. we, we really started essentially as a community center and art space. And so our, our, our local community is really where we're strongest, you know, we've been pulling people in for events and 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 stuff for for years, and so within Bangalore, I feel like we have this, you know, strong position as a, a place that people go for for art, technology events, workshops, stuff. And so for us, it was almost the progression of we we have this space, we have this physical community that's made up of you know a bunch of people. What are other services that we can provide to these people? And so then, then you know, we, we go out to the internet, and so you know, right now we give Wi-Fi, you know, and but like, you know, other things, you know, can we? For a while, we were running also running a program, Video Gaga, where we would uh, stream, you know, viral videos from YouTube, and and then this is sort of pulling in education, and so I really see us as as kind of being this physical portal to the online world, and and we're looking. You know, it, what are those exciting things that are happening across the world, and how can we yeah. ground them in our in our community? And and it's you know it's a very dynamic you know work in progress, but but we're really excited about the the, the possibility for education you know in this. But our again our local community is fairly strong, and so it's 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 not about really feeling like we're remote, you know, so much as like pulling information from 
wherever it, it lives into our, our little local community. Yeah, I, th I think that um, the, I think one of the, one of the massive uh, potentials and affordances of online is obviously um, for us locally is to support people in being more out, outward facing, to raise aspiration and to make those kinds of connections. Um, but it's, mm, it's, it's really about as well taking advantage of digital environments that can overlay physical environments and see how they can work together. And I'm really very much interested in, so we work with a range of partners across the city. We work with Leicester University, De Montfort University, um, and, and diff a range of different organizations. I'm very interested in the idea of the city as the learning environment mm -hmm. and what that means and how technology can support um, citizenship Mm -hmm. across the city and connectivity across the city. But um, one of the projects that we ran, uh, well, we supported, we didn't run, um, in one of the schools recently uh, was a fabulous project called the Cybonga Project that ran at Hamilton Community College. And this is uh, typical of our schools. We have one in three of our, community, of our young people live in comparative poverty in the city. So uh, are not necessarily outward facing community in terms of many opportunities that they get. So this project was a live music concert between young people at Hamilton Con uh, Community College and young people from South Africa. And they use Skype to um, learn about each other's cultures, communities, the different diversities in the two communities to learn um, for Hamilton children to learn traditional songs, for mm. South African um, children to learn their songs. They put a fabulous concert on. It was brilliant. It was an amazing event. But what got the kids in the Hamilton audience the most excited was just after the concert, the music teacher showed a video of various staff members holding bits of paper with the project hashtag on, pulling funny faces, and the kids were in hysterics about it. It was, oh my gosh, there's Miss Brown doing crazy things. You know, and it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's something that I think we as adults need to remember that the world view and the experience of young people is very, very different to our own. And the local is so important to them in terms mm -hmm. of their own identity, in terms of their sense of community, mm -hmm. and in terms of how they have security and how they have a place in the world very easy to forget that being online talking to people all over the world that that's that lots of people's experience of the world is really really local hmm. so you think there's a developmental um, spectrum of people's comfort level or interest in kind of like being physically together versus the ability I mean obviously a small child can't have like a relationship with their mother over a chat room because they don't they can't type and they can't read but they can uh, Skype. <laughs> yeah, the There's probably lots of parents in the audience that yeah. have spent time reading books to their kids. Yeah, no. Well, okay, so, I mean, this is sort of directly, the, the title of this panel comes from a piece of research I was looking at recently, which is um, showing that computer tutoring platforms have gotten as good. There's a famous, like, two sigma effect of, of tutoring, of one-on-one -on -one tutoring versus other kinds of teaching, right? Um, and that's sort of been debunked a little bit, and new research says that it's actually a three quarters of a sigma, and um, and human to human tutoring is um, like computer tutoring. The best computer tutoring is just as good as human to human tutoring in in like very controlled conditions. But there's still this warm body effect, or their belief in the warm body effect, which sometimes on its own is self reinforcing, where people think that by having someone sit next to you, like your mom, or um, that this will help. And I wonder what you guys both think from your own experience, and also from talking to teachers, Josie. Like, what is what is that X factor of learning physically together with other people? What is it that we think of as the benefits of that? I mean, you've probably got a different viewpoint on this. For, from my point of view on this particular project, mm -hmm. um, and, and in the UK school system in general, teaching is not online. The experience is not in those kinds of communities. We're moving towards that, and we're taking advantage of those kinds of learning. But we're at the very early stages of that in the school sector, mm -hmm. much more common in the FE sector and in the university sector. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in terms of particular affordances, there's not a huge uh, body of different kinds
kinds of learning at the moment to test that against. There are things in the, in the UK like the um, Not School Project, which is, uh, supports uh, young people in Second Life and other environments like that. But um, in, terms of, in terms of what their experience is, the, the online learning aspect of it is exotic and exciting at the moment rather than, uh, rather than a, the other way around, so rather than uh, the, their, their experience is typically very, very much face-to-face -face and very much physical. Mm -hmm. We're coming, part of the angle that we're coming at it from is is looking, being in India, but I don't think it's unique to India, this notion of what do we, what do we have available to us? Like, what, what's our, our starting point? And the, especially with technical education, but again, I, I think it applies to lots of other fields. Mm -hmm. We just can't get human experts to come in and give us one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And so, you know, I'm sure it's better, you know, if you could get a, you know, an individual there to sit with you and, and really hold your hand. What we do have is access to people. There, there are no shortage of people around who we can potentially bring on from the local community who can be human. And so if, <laughs> if, we, can, if we can tease out the, the role of the teacher, if we can tease out that aspect of it, which really requires technical experience, and then that aspect of it, which is trying to figure out what's going on with the student. You know, it's like they're, they're not performing. You sort of suspect that they're capable of more, but that, you know, it's, it's not showing in their, their work and, and trying to look below the surface, mm -hmm. um, which I'm, I'm sort of calling coaching a little bit. So I, I sort of feel like this coaching role may be sort of the majority of the time that actual teachers spend and that we can do that and, and really you know, try to explore this question of like, what's the, what's the role of the, the human here? Mm -hmm. and, and how much of that is, is non-technical? Mm -hmm. And then can we you know, move the technical part and then just make that very efficient? Like, you know, so this is like you have a specific well-worded question mm -hmm. which is going across to somebody who can answer that question. But the fact that you don't have real-time access to that person potentially is further encouragement to do more research, spend more time figuring out you know, what exactly your question really is, what is it that you're really asking, what really isn't working as, as expected, so that then the, the experts are, are really dealing with topical stuff as opposed to trying to understand something else. And again, it's, I, our, where we're trying to get to is something that's replicable you know, across India and other parts of the world where where the assumption just is that, is that local experts don't don't exist that we that we have to come something yeah we have yeah. locals and experts but they're not in the same place so I, I want to hold that thought for a moment because I think that's potentially problematic but uh, yeah, I I love what you're saying about you know sort of the mother or the coach I think that there's lots of places where there's innovative programs going on where people are disaggregating roles of teachers and there's these a lot of these you know um, like a Western Governors University where they've got um, academic success coaches or mentors and this is a person that is dedicated to your success um, and by the way they don't ever grade you or evaluate you there's sort of a good cop bad cop going on because the whole other group of people that grades you um, but I think that that's really and they're paid and compensated based on the success of their students so there's a real alignment of, of interest there um, and the support, the, the encouragement, the helping and goal setting and reassuring and motivation, these are all things um, that we are, uh, you know, that are being disaggregated and sort of separated out and, exactly, and for the, exactly these reasons. We say, well, we can upload, we can offload this, pro this yeah. task to information technology and then this is what we're going to do personally. Um, but there's something a little bit different about your project, um, Josie, and it, it does go back to this idea of, you know, how much do we outsource versus how much do we cultivate locally? Because yeah. you are trying to get teachers to be experts in a way. I right? think we're, the aim isn't to get teachers to be experts in education technology. The aim is to identify what the strengths and gaps are in communities to really promote the people who are very confident and are already potentially supporting um, their peers um, producing and sharing resources for other people. So it's to kind of surface that and really to support people wherever they are. 
on that continuum. It's not a race to the top <laughs> in, a, in, in, any, in any respect, um, because obviously uh, a, a good teacher is not necessarily one who's really confident with technology. They may be an outstanding educator, but not necessarily confident at technology at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it's to support them in understanding the ways in which technology might enhance their practice and move them along. Um, but, oh, he's, I've, got, I've got a big, big shaking head. Yeah. It, can, can, we, where are we in call? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Jump in. <laughs> Very passionate. Yeah. You should be allowed to break in. Uh, Josie, I, I keep wondering, uh, for you all in Leicester, what really stands out as uh, key aspects of digital literacy? You know, okay. When you say that, what things really yeah. pop into your mind? So I've got a leaflet that we prepared earlier. Um, I don't really want to kind of read through the different things because the framework that we developed um, is, is obviously quite complex for... I think digital literacy is a highly contested term um, and, and it's called different things in different places too and encompasses different things. So what we were trying to get at is what is digital literacy situated in secondary school practice? What are the most important key strands? And that's what we worked with the schools um, and with other people uh, that, that supported the project to kind of surface. And they're chunked up into six different areas and they're quite broad strokes, but a couple of the areas are very, very relevant to um, open education, focus on things like open education resources, open licensing that, that are included in there. So things like um, creating and sharing content, things like finding, evaluating and organizing content are obviously critical ways. Yeah, you've got, you've got a leaflet. <laughs> You could read it out. You could read it out. Um, and the, there's a couple of other areas in there. And the other one that um, I'd pull out as, as kind of critical to our project is technology-supported professional development, which is really looking at not necessarily ways in which educators can necessarily find um, better or different approaches to using technology to support their practice, but connecting to other educators to enhance their practice holistically. So a way of moving them, helping them self-direct their own learning. Teachers in Leicester are always telling me how important it is our learners are resilient and that they self-direct and all of these things. So really we're asking them to put their money where their mouths are with respect to that and model that kind of practice as well for themselves because they can really benefit from that, that approach too. Does that answer the question or do you want... Does that answer the question? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't clarify it a little bit more for you. But it's a, basically it's a broad framework, and the the areas that we look at are the areas that have been prioritised and worked through with educators as key areas of practice. Yeah. No. I just. Um Wanted to, I just had a comment, which is I, I love the two projects juxtaposed because I think they demonstrate the critical importance of the local interface between the open online wilds of the internet and local communities. And some of what we were talking about earlier today, that tension between, you know, open and transparent versus, well, we don't want to use the term closed, but. Um, you know, grounded, maybe not entirely open and visible. On network key. And, you know, we, in the Digital Media and Learning Initiative, I mean, we're mostly focused on uh, teens, but we work a lot with, um, you know, schools, after school clubs, museums, and libraries because our research really clearly demonstrated that just having things out in the open is not any guarantee that kids will be guided to these things. And I think that's one of the big issues um, and some of what we talked about around the leap bias and open learning is that without those local scaffolds and guides and people who are helping um, build a social wrapper around uh, the activity in the local community, it tends to reproduce the already digitally wired bias. So I think both of your projects are really fantastic in demonstrating that um, 
But I wonder, just in terms of this question of open, the, the local, I mean, ha tends to have a bias for, you know, when you think of openly networked, it's out there for anybody to discover. And obviously, when you're in a physically local space, that's not always the case. But how do you uh, balance or consider an ethos of openness, or how does that manifest within the local community? Or is that not your philosophical bias for the local programming you do? I, I think for us, one of the things that we're, we see ourselves doing is actually being huge evangelists for the open courses that, uh, you know, when people sign up for the classes, they may find that they need additional help and that we can, we can step in and, and, you know, create study groups and additional support. But the first thing I, I think in, in India and possibly the, the world is just, you know, exposing people to this yeah. revolution in, in sort of learning materials that all of this stuff is now freely available and that you should look at it, you know, before worrying about signing up for our program and, and stuff like that, you know, check it out. And that I feel like this is, this is probably, you know, a significant portion of our, our mission is just to push this message that this material is, is out there and freely available and that, you know, people aren't locked into signing up for a specific sort of paid program through a vocational, you know, um, institution like us or anybody else. Um, so that's, that's sort of one perspective. When, when it comes into joining our program, we hire a bunch of staff, so we need to charge tuition in so it gets a little bit tighter. But some other aspects of the openness thing, we're not a degree granting institution, and so we're totally oriented around um, sort of public artifacts, helping people develop out their, their online profile as sort of like our, our degree. Mm -hmm. That, you know, everything that we work with you to do is, is towards putting stuff out in the open for future clients, employers, partners, investors to be able to look at. And that we really see this aspect of openness as being sort of fundamental to what we do and, and also the future of this type of um, learning. I, th I think it's it's very much the same with us. We're um, in, you know, we're uh, very much interested in signposting and curating existing things rather than necessarily reinventing the wheel. Um, very strongly, what's come back from our first kind of uh, our first round of identifying what's going on with the um, with, with staff across the city and and where they are in terms of their practice and their understanding. Um, it's very clearly come back that they are very interested in things like open licensing, um, open educational resources, personal learning networks, connected net, net learning, those kinds of things. But they don't know that much about them. Um, and they do want to find out more. So for us, yes, very much an access issue in terms of equipping people to understand what those things are and to have a shared vocabulary around approaches that can be taken and also um, supporting people in, in being able to critically engage in online communities and activities is really key to the project. So this is a question for Josie. So I have a similar role to you. I work in secondary schools here in Los Angeles, support a network of um, teachers um, incorporating digital literacy into their classrooms. Um, and I actually support a school that's been quite um, in the media um, the past couple of weeks because it's part of the one-to-one -one iPad initiative. Um, and before we were done distributing the iPads, the students had unlocked the privacy settings um, because there was nothing they could do at home with them because they were so locked down. Um, so our district, didn't really see the openness. <laughs> in fact, they closed the device up completely in the interest of student privacy and safety. Um, and so my question for you is, have you experienced any of those barriers at your district level or do your, how does your district deal with those kinds of things um, in terms of allowing students openness but protecting themselves as well so that we can start to think about educating our district leaders. So I'm familiar with that story. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, I feel for the people that are involved in that situation at the moment. Um, uh, the findings from the survey have very much shown that, well, they've confirmed what we suspected, which was that the uh, schools in Leicester, similar to schools throughout the country, take a rather protectionist approach to e-safety um, in that it's framed within blocking, filtering and banning for a variety of reasons, not all of the reasons because people in schools immediately want to block and ban and stop things. There's, there's a kind of other issues that go on around that as well. But um, the, that kind of protectionist approach to e-safety can be very, very effective. <laughs> but it's also linked to um, a lack of engagement with actually how young people are using technologies, engaging technologies, um, not just outside of the school gates when they get home, if they've managed to hack their iPad that they've got from school, but also what they're doing in schools, because many of our learners have data plans, they're not connecting to school networks. You know, they're doing, some of them, quite reprehensible things within the school environment, but um, a lot of the time that's not visible because those devices are not acknowledged in those environments, which has the impact of, so for example, if I'm if I'm getting side bullied at school, I'm not going to report it because I'm going to be the one in trouble because I'm not supposed to have a mobile device in school. So those implications. So the way that I'm looking at addressing those issues is a few things. We're introducing very localised, granular um, filtering and blocking into the schools. Um, and in terms of bringing your own device programmes and looking at supporting those moving forward, um, I'm providing the infrastructure for that, the programme is providing the infrastructure for that, um, so that schools can make the decision to go down those routes. And to be honest, school budgets are flat, and they're not going to be any different for the next few years. So while schools can maintain their level of spend around infrastructure back-end, devices, they're not necessarily going to be able to make anything like a one-to-one -one investment in learner devices in that way, unless they move towards bring your own device models. Um, for me, the, um, it, it's, it, it shows a lack of understanding of what people are like, let alone young people are like, to give people a locked device and expect them to pay for that themselves. Um, and or, or expect them to make good use of that at home if they can't access those kinds of things. So the approach that we're taking is um, segmenting off uh, devices so that when you're in school, you are connected to the school networks and you are, um, you are subject to local conditions and local agreements around that. When you're at home, that's your device, that's your business, that, you know, and you have privacy around that. And the, the other, obviously, really critical element around that is e-safety education that more explicitly addresses the kinds of issues um, that really impact on young people. Um, that sometimes are managed to get overlooked at the moment because there's a, there's a kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a liability is kind of closed off by the fact that you're not supposed to be doing that in school. So, but the story can't end there. It can't end there because uh, it's just it's it's not responsible and it's not a um, it's not a helpful response for those young people. So I would have rolled that program out slightly differently. To be honest, <laughs> if I was here. <laughs> is there another? Yeah, I think. Yeah, is there another question? Yeah, you had a question a way back. Yeah. No, you, you, me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about the role of uh, policy to kick it one level up. So we're talking a lot about the learners, we're talking about re-educating the teachers, and in your case, Freeman, how does this hook up at all with government allocations or regulations in terms of what sorts of opportunities need to be 
offered to folks of various income levels? And for you, Josie, um, what kinds of standards um, are we going to write in or are we going to give teachers um, some freedom from needing to slavishly um, serve? Because dealing with the, the learners is phenomenal and the teachers is important. But if their range of motion is limited by uh, lack of resources and support and infrastructure, then I wonder if we can only go so far. So for, for us, I'll say our program in some senses is a response to a very heavily regulated higher education system that has um, basically sort of somewhat artificially constricted the number of uh, seats, the number of people who can study computer science in universities in, in India is, is very small, basically. The government sort of tells each engineering school how many computer science seats they can have, how many electrical engineering seats, how many mechanical seats, and so on. Everybody wants to study computer science, but that only the, the top scores actually get those, and everybody else ends up studying another, another field, fully intending to come out and then learn computer science. <laughs> And so, um, so, so the, the formal education system has a, a large number of issues that, that we just sort of sidestep and try to offer as low cost a program as we can that addresses very specifically you know, that set of skills that is going to help people um, get the kinds of jobs and do the kinds of things that they, they want. And so we're, we're small, and we're just trying to stay out of um, the government's uh, line of sight in some sense. So that's, <laughs> that's our response. Uh, my hope is that, like many private schools, that it's a, if we can demonstrate that it's an effective model, that other small private schools would pick it up and offer low cost, similar low-cost pro programs in their areas, and then possibly maybe government schools at some point we'll incorporate these types of things. But, but I, have no, I have no window into that world, and so I'm, I'm just trying to you know, make this one instance work, and, and yeah, so that's our approach. So um, in European terms, the European Commission has come out very strongly over many years, and again last week there was a huge launch around the importance of open educational resources um, in, in, in education right across the age groups. So our, our kind of policy framing is probably at the moment more at European level than it is at UK level in terms of uh, directives that are coming out and support for schools in that particular way. In terms of the kind of access question, yes, if you do not have access, you are horribly disadvantaged and you you know, and, and characteristically now, I think, in uh, digital societies, actually, uh, lack of access has become a marker of uh, social inequality and social um, and, and being outside of the mainstream. Um, and we have uh, learners in the city who don't have good access and who don't have parents who can necessarily support them in ways if they did have access. Um, so uh, one of the issues that we're trying to deal with within the programme, we're extremely fortunate in Leicester to be part of a build programme. Lots of uh, schools in the UK are not as fortunate as our city. The work that we're doing has been designed to support schools wherever they kind of are in that build programme. So some of them are, have not got uh, fantastic equipment and systems and services. And the work is very much trying to support schools wherever they are and it is transferable to people supporting young people in that age group, wherever they are, within, uh, within limits. But for me, the key thing that we can address and we can support is this issue around young people's digital literacy. And by supporting staff, we can try and ensure that no young person is leaving school at 16 ill-equipped to take advantage of the opportunities that technology affords and ill-equipped to look after themselves at a reasonably basic level 
in terms of their online identity and activity and community development. You know, we very much want to see young people positioned as agents and as active agents now, you know, whether they're 11 or whether they're 14, uh, and not as some of the people that we're preparing for adulthood. So uh, really that's how we're trying to address that issue. And it is, it is a massive, very real issue. Um, but I think making sure that people are equipped to engage and understand, identify and recognise and evaluate things online and access communities online is a really, really important way that we're going to address those inequality issues. Um, sure, yeah. With Freeman's program, do you have an established attitude about forums as a way for uh, students to get questions answered? You know, have you tried it? Do you want to try it? Uh, yeah, I'll say absolutely. I think uh, an important part of our program is, is really going to be getting people to engage with the discussion forums that are happening sort of around, around the web, uh, both the discussion forums uh, happening attached to the different MOOCs that we work with, but also on sites like Stack Exchange and Hacker News, that, that be, you know, part of becoming sort of a, a professional sort of software developer is being able to communicate effectively, understand sort of, you know, kind of these human soft skills of how to engage with, with the forms, and, and it's how, how professional software developers engage with the community, get questions answered and answered questions and become sort of civic members of the community. So, so yeah, absolutely. I, I asked particularly because you, you, you commented a fair amount on the a scarcity of experts, mm -hmm. right, in, in the community and forums seem like one avenue to, uh, to get yeah, around that yeah, absolutely. limitation. Yeah, so, and I think a, an important aspect of the coaches is really going to be to, to, help, to help students sort of navigate how to connect with the forums, how to ask, you know, reasonable questions on the forums, how to contribute back into the forums, and, and sort of build up karma. And, you know, also looking at sort of other aspects of, you know, what a modern degree looks like. Uh, many of these forums actually have a, a, a clear thing of karma, of sort of your reputation that you build up. And I think that this is a, a reasonable thing to track, you know, as we take a student through this program, that they should be working on building their, their yeah. karma on Stack Exchange, um, as the, that's going to help them get their questions answered later in life. And that the things that you have to do in order to build your karma are all things that are important to do. It's answer other people's questions. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's a really important part of the program and, and just sort of this career path. Just something that's striking me and in what both of you guys are saying and also in the questions is um, the idea of how much more local politics is than the internet is. And the idea that as you guys work through issues of access and equity, you have to also work through the issues that people pay taxes in the place where they live. And so initiatives and, and um, and goals are constituted at a local level. Um, but the, the benefits of open learning extend far beyond the borders. They, they sort of are distributed to everyone who's using them. And I think maybe not so much on the, on the uptake side of things, but in the distribution side of things, when you have public universities who are suddenly creating and supporting these kinds of programs that are benefiting people all over the world, which is great, but that doesn't speak to their mission and doesn't speak to the locality of where they're located and who's going to fund them. Um, so. But I think it comes down to that kind of fundamental approach to creating open educational resources and putting things out there, which is if um, you are doing work, whether it's publicly funded or not, but I think particularly if it is publicly funded, mm -hmm. by releasing things openly, you're not losing anything and you're increasing the benefit. Right. So, you know, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a fundamental approach, I think. I totally agree with you and I think that that 
that kind of held true for the first 10 years when we were talking about resources. But now we're talking about experiences. We're talking about server time. We're talking about two-way broadband communication. And this stuff does cost money. I mean, it's not totally free. Sure. Um, and so I guess, it, to me, I think it it's continues to be kind of more of a problem than not. But I don't know. I mean, maybe the answer is if you focus on the benefits to people who are participants on the end, on that end, and say this is the kind of learning we're going to engage in, um, then you know, then there's a purpose to publicly funding it everywhere. But eager to hear what the audience thinks. <laughs> India's had a, a number of experiments in trying to sort of mandate access mm -hmm. that, that so far haven't haven't really worked out in terms of trying to like, there was one project to try to bring 100,000 villages online. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of what people were doing, how it actually got implemented and stuff got, got sort of more, more complicated. And so I think we're going through a, another sort of wave now where, where more rural areas are coming online, mm -hmm. but that it's, it's, not, it's not really happening it's not really being driven by the government at this stage. It's more being driven by, by demand, and and that you know as people are demanding it, they're coming and using it in all the ways that we use it in central areas. I I would love to see a coordinated, intelligent central effort to like give access and to give access to these types of materials. I I haven't seen it yet. What went wrong before? Um, the, I don't know all of the details, but, but some of it dealt a little bit with sort of how it, how it got laid out and what the, what the incentives were to the, the individual sort of entrepreneurs in each sort of rural area that, that sort of had the resources to set up a, a small sort of community information kiosk kind of thing. But then what, that there, there are local language issues involved with sort of like what's the information that they're, they're asking or able to provide to the, the local community. Um, and the, at some level, the, the incentives were coming through a, a government scheme that was sort of paying to set the, the space up, but less tied into people actually using it. Mm -hmm. And so, so there wasn't so much incentive to forcing people to, to use infrastructure that got created sort of in a, in a vacuum to some degree. Do we have any other questions? OK, maybe we'll wrap it up. Thanks a okay. lot, you guys. Yeah, thank it you. It was great. Thank you.